everybody the american space museum i'm mark marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious with the usiac brothers hey. tom and mark how you doing guys great well we don't have marty with us today so if there's any anomalies on the program please let me know i'm looking at my cell phone marty's got the day off and that creates a lot of fun for me to do this as a one-armed paper hanger but i got these geniuses with me so <laughs> Everything's kind of worked out. And behind us, look at this beautiful photograph we have from our friend Mike Killian. And where is Artemis? There it is. There right it behind, is. You, right behind me. There it is. <laughs> Gorgeous sunrise there, Mike. Mike, we love you. You're a great photographer, and we need to share more of your wonderful pictures because uh, he's on the Space Coast, and you guys aren't. Hey. <laughs> Actually, these two brothers are from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And... Uh, we hope that, that we're getting out there. I, I, I'm too far away from my control lab here to see. But let me check real quick and make sure that we're getting out there. Guys, how are you? How was the trip down here from Pennsylvania? Pretty good. I mean, no, no real problems. No major traffic jams. Uh, we came a little differently than we did in the past, but that was to avoid traffic. So, yep, it's a good trip. Well, good. Well, we are live, and uh, we've already got a couple comments. Thank you, Cynthia Rossi. Uh, hello there, Longia Sani. He is in uh, India. All right. And hello. we're glad to have you. William Whiting says hello. So, okay, we see that, that we're out there working on doing our thing today. So we got a nice program with you here. Uh, the UCAC brothers, of course, have been launch photographers for over 30 years, 35 years. Uh, Let's try you've 50. even going back to try, yeah, 50. try 50. Yeah, you're there at <laughs> Apollo 15. But you don't look that old That's until we right. look in the mirror, good, right? Good living. Yeah, good living. We got three astronaut birthdays to talk about, astronauts that they all have met and know. And we're going to talk a little bit about the cameras, as we do talk a lot about photography. I am a professional photographer, and these guys are too, and, and we love talking about it. Uh, uh, because that's the images that are our space age. That's how we know. You don't, probably the only sound clip you remember is. The eagle has landed. The eagle has landed, and that's one small step that's for man. man. One giant but uh, man. the photos tell the whole story, and we've had a great weekend together. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you brought. Well, first of all, we've heard you mention on the air uh, about shoe fly pies, which are a staple delicacy where we come delicacy. from in Lancaster <laughs> County in the Amish country. So to take a, a line from an old TV series, we have pies to deliver. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As if I haven't been begging for this long enough, a shoe fly pie. Now let's see. I'm going to get my fork over here. Where's uh, uh I'm going to try it here on the air. Yep. So if I gag and you guys will have to take over, we'll, we'll catch there, right? But uh, I'm going to dig in there. It kind of looks like a, a big old pecan pie. All right. And we dig into that. Actually, the... I never ate one. Mm. <laughs> you never ate one? Mm -mm. <laughs> Why the heck I like this? A lot of brown sugar in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, I'll, I'll eat that for supper tonight. There you go, with our compliments. Thank you, guys. A shoe fly pie here on Stay Curious, all right? That's a burst. That's the first. Well, let me get over here. Mm. That is pretty good. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Kind of reminds me of those small pecan pies in there. Uh, but uh, I think it's based on uh, brown sugar. Brown and, sugar. That's what, that's what and, the, uh, the main ingredient makes there. it tick. All right. Well, we've got, uh, we want to talk first about, um, I wonder if he's watching. Our good friend, Chris Cowley. Chris? Hey, Chris. How you doing, Chris? If he's watching. Hi, Chris. These are uh, some beautiful mannequins that have his beautiful T-shirts and his and his dad's on there. Yes, we are selling these to support our museum. Uh, hi, K-Soul, on a rainy day here. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, as I'm looking, Carlton Bailey's in the house here. Cynthia Rossi's watching. Dave Stangy says, looking and sounds good. Thank you, Dave. Needed that shout out there. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, Ann, Ann Sullivan's on there. You know Ann? Ann Rishave Sullivan? No, I don't believe I know. Okay. I don't believe I know her. So uh, uh, 
And Cynthia says, been ages since I've had shoe fly pie, in fact, in Lancaster when visiting my brother. Cynthia Sam. Rossi shouts out there. Cynthia used to live in Allentown, which is a little bit north of us, and uh, that's you, they could come down for their shoe and we'll get pie. you your shirt cynthia your size we ran out of and we're going to get them reordered here after we get over all this artemis stuff going on but um she ordered one of each of these beautiful t-shirts right and you can own them yourself here is our good friend paul uh, chris Callie with his dad paul there uh move your head there a little bit there so, so, no, I'll, I'll do this i can do this there we go no I, oh oh no, not that there that's what, whoa, what, what happened there? All right. There you go. I'm messing around here. Marty knows this better than I do, but uh, we will put the link up this weekend so that you can order your T-shirts. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. You guys are going home with some on there. So uh, thank you all for supporting our museum. We are going to be open Sunday. We're usually closed Sunday, so if you're coming down for the launch, Looking for something to do downtown? Come on down. We'll be open from 12 to 6. We're open Saturday from 10 to 5. We might stay open a little longer on Saturday, depending on who's in the building here. After all, this is the only game in town, and traffic's going to start getting crazy. Probably is already crazy out there. I haven't been out there since this morning. But we've got several astronaut birthdays today. Uh, really some great people born today, and I'm telling you, over... Uh, 25 people born in the month of August. Wow. And these people are astronaut people, right? A lot of people born in August, of course. But uh, we're now transitioning from the Leos to the uh, Libras. And uh, uh, yesterday we had Lee Archambold and Drew Foisel. Uh Day before was R Dick Richards, Anna Fisher, Steve Lindsay, and Marianne Weber. Uh, this month, we celebrated Story Musgrave, Charlie Bolton, Rick Massimino, Kathy Thornton, Tom Hennon, Dave Wolf. I mean, wow. You guys know all those big names of the astronauts because they've done great things. Well, today, we're wishing a happy birthday to John Blaha. You guys have met John Blaha before, haven't you? Yes, we've met him. Very nice man. Well, he was born in San Antonio, Texas on August 26, 1942. He's got 161 days in space. Most cool is his five-month stay on the Russian Mir space station, I think. Uh, he was a pilot twice and a commander twice of a space station, as well as living on, on, on the Mir. So happy uh, 70th birthday to John Blaha. I take that back. Oops, 80. He's not going to want me to remind him of that, but he was born in 42. So John is 80 years old. And uh, guys, when I crashed the party out there at the uh, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, with you, uh, we walked in that narrow room. There must have been 20 astronauts hanging around there. And uh, I heard uh, my name, and it was Bruce Melnick, calling me over to meet Mr. John Blaha, who was really one of my favorite astronauts, a great guy, a uh, very humble guy, and has done a lot for our country. And then how about happy 63rd birthday to Pretty K. Hire? Uh, she is a, a NASA engineer who became an astronaut. Uh, and some name, who, who else has done that? Nicole, Nicole Stott. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, was, Nicole. And uh, I think Joan Higginbotham also uh, worked out there. Uh, so uh, Kay was born uh, August 26, 1959 in Mobile, Alabama. And she's a Navy captain. Uh, two space shuttle missions after working as an engineer. Uh, what were her missions? Were uh, can't pull that rabbit over there. Ninety and one thirty. And uh, we've been in contact with Kay to help us here at the museum. She loves coming to the Space Coast, and so we hope that she can come to uh, some of our events here. And actually, we want to get her behind the camera here on Stay Curious in front of the cameras, actually. So, Kay, happy 63rd birthday to you. You enjoy it. And then we have a very special man who is 90 years old today. Uh, this, of course, is uh, Mr. Joe Engel. What a, a, a checkered career Mr. Joe Engel had as an astronaut. Uh, number one, a trivia question. Who is the only human to have flown in two space planes? And that's Joe Engel. Mr. Engel. Colonel Engel. 
Colonel Engel was, uh, there he is in his shuttle blues, but he was an X-15 pilot. So, yes, he flew the X-15 to the edge of space, got his astronaut wings there, and then uh, flew the shuttle. Now, Engel, as you guys know, was going to be one of the moonwalkers. He was going to command probably Apollo 19 or 18, maybe 20, but he was going to the moon before they canceled those last three flights. He was the original lunar module pilot for Apollo 17 because he was he on the was. backup crew for 14 and they would rotate three missions ahead. Then what happened was the powers of be uh, decided that a geologist should fly since 17 was going to be the last flight and they pretty much well not pretty much they pulled him off the flight and put jack schmidt in his place and uh you'd think that caused some friction and so forth they really wanted a geologist a, a great geologist named lee silver with uh, gene shoemaker trained these guys mm -hmm. and uh schmidt was a true geologist turned astronaut and uh, they needed, a, and it paid off. He, he knew what he was seeing when he was on the moon there at the uh, Taurus Littrow plane. But so they say, Joe, here's a picture you took of him, Tom. No, Mark. Oh, Mark, Mark took it? Okay. They say, uh, uh, let's see if I can do this. Where, where's my picture there? Hmm. I'm trying to figure out. Oh, there it is. Hey, bring, there he is behind us. Uh, they say, Joe, we're going to bump you from this moon landing. Hope you're not too bad, but I tell you what, you pick any flight you want of the Skylabs, we're planning three of those, or the Apollo Soyuz test project. What do you want to do? And Joe said, none of them. None of them. And oh, you uh, know why he said that? He wanted to fly something. He wanted to fly something with wings, exactly. So he waited for the shuttle. And, and uh, uh, Joe Engel, a very important person in the shuttle era. Of course, he was the commander uh, on STS-2. Uh, there, that's his patch there with Mr. Truly. All right. Uh, Engel Truly flew two in November 81. So he waited uh, from 1965 to 81, basically, to fly. Well, actually, Joe Engel flew the Enterprise on the approach and landing tests, um, which is the reason why he is in this picture here. This picture, uh, and that's a Discovery behind him. He flew Discovery and Enterprise, um, and that happens to be Discovery behind him when they were bringing it to the Air and Space Museum and removing the Enterprise, which was there since the museum opened, and sent it to New York on the uh, Intrepid, is it? You know, the intrepid. So, so it was kind of special for Joe. He was the only one there that had flown both the shuttles that were involved in the uh, transfer that day. Exactly. And thank you. That's why I have you here to add some color to this. Uh, you see the tiles behind him in the head. Right. You can't those figure the, out where the, the real shuttles. flight tiles where the uh, Enterprise uh, and, did not and, have and, real tiles on. And uh, uh, Enterprise, uh, he was uh, teamed up with, it was Fullerton and Hayes and Engel and Truly, right? Correct. So Engel and Truly flew the, the tests of Enterprise, a couple uh, uh, landings, and uh, then they flew together as a team on the second shuttle of all, which people, you know, don't remember who did the second of anything, but that second space shuttle had to be just as hairy as the first, all right? The first time it worked, and now you're saying, it's got to work again? <laughs> it's been to space already? We've never done that before. So this is truly another remarkable flight that's in the annuals of space, I think, is overlooked as a, a bold and brave mission uh, by Joe Engel and Richard Truly. Well, one of the things that Joe Engel did on two, which was for the first time, is he flew a lot of the reentry manually. Oh, he did? Which was normally set up. The computer would fly a lot of times until the commander would take over at about just as they were entering the uh, final approach uh, in the heading alignment circle. But Joe flew a lot more of the uh, actual entry phase hmm. manually. Well, we're talking with the USIAC brothers. Beside me is Tom, the big brother, and Mark, the little brother there. And we have, uh, they found Stay Curious somehow, and we found them. They found the museum. And uh, so uh, let me do this here. Let's take Joe off of there. Let's, let's, uh, 
But once again, we want to brag on Mike Kelly in there, Mike. Mike, thank you for letting us use this photo. Outstanding, Mike. Uh, job, Mike. Uh, this is this is the naked eye view. All right, this is a fifty millimeter. We call it in the business view. Uh, so you can see it that good. All right, with your naked eye. So you bring binoculars or even a telephoto lens on a camera, and you got a better pew there. So, uh, uh, and we've had Mike on our show. Google Mike Killian on our YouTube channel. Uh, he is one of the world's premier aviation photographers, bar none. If he could hang by his his uh, ankles out uh, an airplane photographing a, a, a vintage bomber or something, I think he. Probably, you think he probably he's already? Yeah, he, he's uh, <laughs> he, he's good. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's good, and and uh, I don't share his pictures enough, and and I was looking for something like this, Mike, and and you had it, so. Mike Killian, good job, buddy, there. We look forward to having you back on Stay Curious. And maybe we'll get you on and talk about the Artemis experience there. I just saw him today. Oh, I did you? The, you get, get, the get, getting, getting your credentials well, today? I did. I uh, so tell us about that. You were credentialed there. That's official. Uh, the official Artemis uh, show it up there to our, our fans. Okay, yep. sweet. That's uh, for launch photography. Uh, tomorrow I'll be setting remote cameras out. Mike was... Uh, I saw him at the press site parking lot today while they were waiting for uh, a lightning alert to dissipate. Really? Uh, yeah, they had two bus fools out, loaded up, drove them out to the pad. As soon as they got there, the lightning alert came in, so they had to turn their buses around, brought them back to the press site. Uh, ran into a, a bunch of, of good friends, uh, Teresa, Mike, uh, John, uh, Alex, the whole the whole gang was there. And... Um, I was telling them, and we were, we were just chit-chatting and talking. I told him we were going to be on the show Good. Uh, today. So he said, yeah, he's uh, looking forward to getting back on. And we were uh, just catching up with things. And then hopefully this thing goes, and we're going to be setting up cameras uh, tomorrow. All right. Couldn't do them today, huh? Well, he was. they had set out remotes inside the pad perimeter fence, which is it was a more exclusive shot. There was only so many people that were allowed to go in. Mm-hmm. So they set stuff up yesterday, and today was basically a service visit to go back and make sure everything was set up correctly and everything was cleaned up and ready to go, and they got pulled back. So uh, I hope they made it out because the weather here has been kind of crazy pretty much all afternoon. So hope they got out there. Every afternoon it's been crazy around here. Some real bad storms as the east and west coast uh, 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 lows are, are crashing into each other. Uh, let me see about my names on here. I'm trying to figure out M. Uh, trying to figure out how to, to work my names here. All right. We got, we got my night sky thing on the bottom there. Not sure how that happened, but, uh, we're with Marty without Marty today. So, um, hmm. My name on the bottom. Should, trying to rotate you guys' names in there. Uh, I'll bet that's Triple T. Oh, we're not going to worry about it. Look at the night sky with Stellarium Astronomy software. That's 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 a good. Uh, uh, that way you can. There's a plug. There, there's a plug. We haven't done enough stargazing with me because of all this Artemis stuff going on. So we've been Artemis gazing. So uh, you're excited about it. You photographed a lot of things. Uh, what do you, what do you think it's going to look like? Well. Uh... Into a discussion today with uh, Scott, who is up at the press site, and this is going to be a different. It's it's heritage hardware. It's shuttle main engines, solid rocket motors, more powerful. And my main concern, especially with our remote cameras, was sound levels. Now that doesn't sound like a lot with rockets. It's going to be noisy and hundred plus decibels. But this is the first time that they've ever launched this rocket igniting four shuttle engines underneath a launcher platform. Back in the shuttle days, those three engines in the back of the shuttle were exposed. So you could see the smoke and the flames coming out. And of course, the noise is going to be more. This thing is down below the launcher deck. Plus, there's going to be water oh, dumping on it. And uh, so, so... Sorry I'm, about that. That's all right. I'm more concerned with uh, sound levels for my cameras, to tell you the truth, is whether or not they're going to fire when I want them to fire. Uh huh. So we'll see. I mean, it's it's a it's a test it's a test mission for all us photographers. Um, 
I know they're not coming for me. You can probably hear the <laughs> sirens outside. Yeah, uh, what did uh, you guys do? No, no. Uh, so we'll see. You stole I mean, that shoot fly pie in that's there. That's right. <laughs> Which is pretty good, there. actually. I can't wait to get a little Cool Whip on that. And, there you go. And uh, I can't believe you haven't tried it. Well, he's a he's a picky eater. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a little brother for you there. Okay. Well, uh, so, so we'll see. So I mean, we're going to see that what it'll fire. It fires, and and another concern as the photographers out here locally know, uh, there's a scheduled SpaceX launch on Sunday. What time? Uh, I believe it's ten o'clock, ten o'clock or so in the evening, Sunday, Sunday night, and this will be a first. You've never heard me say this before, but I hope, I hope it gets delayed. Okay. Because my fear and some of the other photographers' fear is, when that thing goes off, it's going to set off the triggers for our Artemis cameras, oh. which are only so far away. So, please. So NASA is allowing a private company to launch their rocket over this Artemis that they've been doing not for so, 12 years. Not so, it's not going to be going over the pad. Uh -huh. It's going to be making noise that are sound activated. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. But still, I'm saying I can't believe NASA's letting them launch uh, well, with with a, with a, the it, big the big rocket that everyone's been talking about on the pad. Anything could go wrong. And, and wipe it out. But, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, you're saying, yeah, well, of course it's going to mess it up. Of course. I mean, how could you not think it wouldn't? Well, here's the here's the positive side of that. Uh, there's no uh, 36 exposure rolls of film anymore to deal with. If it sets a couple hundred frames or so off of a, you know, big gig memory card, uh -huh. then there's going to be more there. Okay, so uh, so, so uh, yeah, so we'll that thirty-six up all the exposure film. roll is now a five hundred exposure. Yeah, well, no, I've got uh, there's sixty-four gig cards. There's well over five thousand exposures, easy. So it will be reset itself and everything, it, it and ready will, for the next one. It, it will, but if Steve Nolte's watching, <laughs> which I don't want, Hi, him Steve. To, don't want him to panic. Yeah, Steve but, Nolte, um, one of your partners in crime. He has designed our boxes with trapdoors on them. So when those things can sit out there, I'm going to set them out tomorrow and it can rain like it's raining now, tomorrow night, whatever, those cameras are going to be protected. We've got Lisa Marie says, Space Coast shenanigans. Good luck with the remote. Oh, thank you. you, know, Lisa thank you, Marie. Lisa. All right. I uh, so we're going to have a little program with these photographers. Tom's going to talk about some of the early film cameras that they used in space. And this is what film looks like, folks, okay? There's the silver halide crystals embedded on a plastic sheet and in a canister. And 24 shots there would cost you a $5 for the nice Fuji Superior. Good quality of film there, uh, which has an ISO of 400. I shot a heck of a lot of that. Uh, and uh, Or you get a 36 exposure roll. And then if you take 24 exposures, then you have to take them to a good lab. It's going to cost you at least 10 bucks to photograph them. So to see 24 pictures, it's going to cost you about 15 bucks. And you add that up, that's 50 cents a picture. All right. Mm -hmm. To see even the bad ones for 50 cents each. And uh, so today we have Digital World where Unlimited, they're basically taking a movie and grabbing frames out of it. In my opinion, and uh, and Mark's or Tom's going to talk a little bit about that with some of the first cameras on the moon. But we wanted to mention how wild it is getting around here and fun. As last night, guys, we bumped into these two astronauts. We were lucky to to uh, see. Uh, uh, but let me go. Let's do this. There we go. Who we got there, Tom? Well, we have Jack Lausma. And Doug Hurley, um, we had invited Jack to dinner with us last night. Ed Zarell is actually Mark did. And uh, while we were there, just as we were finishing up, uh, a lady came over that, that introduced herself and that to Jack. Uh, I forget her. What was her? Hey, Marsha. <laughs> Hi, Marsha. Hey, Marsha. I'm sorry. That's okay. And she said, uh, Doug Hurley, they were in a, a function in the other room. 
uh, at Zarella's, and she said, Doug Hurley's here. Um, I think he'd like to meet you. Well, she asked him first if she ever, if he ever met Doug, and, and uh, she, uh, he said no. So Doug came over, and the two of them uh, talked a little shop. Uh, early days versus um, Doug was the pilot on the last space shuttle flight, and he was also the, the one that flew on the first uh, commander, commander of the first uh, demo two, yeah, SpaceX, SpaceX flight to uh, to the ISS. So. Uh, that was a sort of a impromptu meeting right there. It was great. Yeah, eighty-six year old, and uh, he's fifty-six. Uh, Hurley there. Uh, so how do you know Jack? You just oh, wait a minute. They dropped a, a dime there on us, there, folks. That they were having dinner with Jack Lausma, one of the legends of the Apollo era. Okay, uh, on Skylab two, two spacewalks, and then he was uh, on STS three. All right. So how did you get to know Jack there? Well, we met Jack uh, through the ASF, which has uh, a bunch of different uh, uh, astronaut, astronaut scholarship, scholarship foundation. foundation, and also at Space Fest, which was a uh, another gathering of uh, astronauts and artists from all over the country, and we were privileged to photograph those uh, events over the years, and got to be uh, really good friends, uh, especially with Jack. And uh, I photographed his uh, 21st birthday party, actually, a, yeah. few, a few years ago in Houston, thanks to his uh, daughter, Mary. Now, wait um, a minute. 21 years old. He looks a little older than that. Why is... Uh... Well, he just happens to be a leap year baby. Ah, born on February 29th. Oh, so, yes. So he's only had 21 birthdays at that time. But one of the greatest guys you'll ever want to see. Well, my privilege to have dinner with you guys and, and got to talk to him quite a bit. And uh, uh, he, he, he's, he was always kind of thought of as a man's man guy in, in the, the old Apollo era. But, mm -hmm. but he's really a gentle giant. And, uh, uh, gosh, 86 years old, he can snap stuff off. This was happening 50 years ago. I couldn't believe some of the stuff he was talking time. about. Yeah, he had the, he, he had the table. He, in his hand. he had some good stories. He loves to talk about his space life. Uh, uh, he's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. A big, uh, I hate to say it, Dave Stangy. He's a go blue. The go Buckeyes, I told him. I, I, I and uh, But he's a big Michigan supporter and uh, lovely man. Lives in Kerrville, Texas. His, his lovely wife, Gracia, and his kids all taking care of the mom and dad now. And uh, we might get Jack in the museum and on Stay Curious one day. Uh, and it was a pleasure meeting uh, Colonel Lausma there. Uh, Ura Marine, too, we'll throw in there. So, well, I'm going to show you. Uh, so, uh, like I posted this picture on Facebook. Hey, you coming down here to the Space Coast or live here? Look around the restaurants this weekend. When you're getting gas, look around. You might see an astronaut because Harrison Schmidt was out there at the Kennedy Space Center yesterday. I saw uh, Charlie um, Precourt, uh, mission specialist. He was walking around out there like he was just a regular tourist. And uh, so they, they, everybody, the VIPs are coming in for the uh, the launch of the first rocket uh, taking a uh, spacecraft to the moon in a long while. Okay, so uh, so we're looking forward to that. And we will, like I said, we'll be open Sunday for those of you coming down here. So you can check uh, check us out there. And uh, Cynthia Rossi, she met him and says, yes, truly gracious and friendly. Cynthia, I showed him your Facebook page last night at dinner because I wanted him to know what he's doing and what all these astronauts do. Uh, they don't have to do this. All right. They could sit at home and, and be watching Jeopardy and feeding their dogs and uh, whatever. But I want him to know that, that what you're doing... Uh, touches the hearts of a lot of people and Cynthia Rossi was one of them. She posted a lot of pictures of his encounter at the astronaut yesterday. You guys agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, all the astronauts spend a lot of time uh, dealing with the public and it's mostly to inspire the next generation, you know, to, to keep on doing. You can do what I did is, is the big message I get a lot. All right, well, let's get to some of the, the pretty pictures that I'm going to have Tom talk about. Uh, uh, really got to know you gentlemen when we were 
at the Oud Bar Hazzy. Uh, and Marty just walked in. Hey, All right, Marty. Marty. Hey, Marty. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, have a seat in the bleachers over there next to Carlton. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you can you can take over there, my friend. Uh, uh, I've, I've I've been playing with it. I can't. Oh, I got Maynette up there. I can't figure out how to get the name on the bottom, but you'll get me straightened out there, Marty. Here, you're gonna you're gonna need the uh, one, two, three. There you go. Toss him a mouse in the air there. All right. Thank you for coming, Marty. Hope everything went well for you today. Uh, this is at the Udvar Hazy Smithsonian, where they have a display of all the cameras in space. And I was drooling over all this, and some of them I've even owned in my own hands. Some close-ups there, the Hasselblads, the Niker mats. You got some film cameras in the background there. But, uh, Tom, tell us a little bit. I'm turning it over to you now, my friend. And with this picture here, tell us a little bit about the early days in film photography. Yeah, on these wonderful well, iconic images of NASA. Back during the Mercury program, um, John Glenn had a camera that he had bought. <laughs> it was a 35 millimeter, which is with that Marty, that bottom right there. name, I don't know how to get Maynette's name off the bottom. Okay. And uh, took some nice photos with it, but it was decided that they wanted to try and get some better photographs, uh, more resolution and uh, film. The bigger the film, the better the resolution. It would be like today, a digital camera that's 10 megapixels versus a camera that's uh, 40 megapixels. You know, just uh, a range. The, the higher the megapixel, the more uh, resolution you have. Or and sharper the sharp. picture is what resolution and means. With, um, with film, the bigger the frame, the more resolution. So, as you see in the photo here, they sort of in, instituted the Hasselblad camera uh, for Wally to take up. This was the first time on Sigma 7. And if you look here, you can see that I'm holding basically the same camera. In fact, it probably is just a newer version of that camera. And that's what, uh, that's what he used on, uh, mm -hmm. on his flight. Get a good look at it there. Yeah. Got a winding mechanism here to wind the film. Mm -hmm. You actually take the back off and put the film. Tell, as I'm doing this, describe you describe it for well, me. Well, what this is the film magazine. That's where the film is stored. That's used now. The film is wider than that. It's um, uh, the film is two and a quarter inches wide. Seventy millimeter. And uh, that and is, 35. that's the difference, 35 millimeter versus 70 millimeter. So you have a bigger, um, you have a bigger area to, uh, to image. It's behind this plate that you have to attach the camera uh, to the back. So your film is actually, you would have a couple of these loaded already. Right. So what you do then, we, we used, like, we use these Hasselblads for a lot of our remote cameras. And so did Carlton that's here with us today. And what we would do is we would preload the film. Mm -hmm. We would load the film in the back of this magazine. And um, on rollers. On, you know, okay. You got rollers there that this would go around. Okay. In mm -hmm. a bigger canister around the back there. And it would wind it from one roller to the next, the take up reel. And so there's a lot of precision to these, okay? Particularly the film being flat. If That's the film wasn't important. flat, the film's not waiting, flat, uh, you would um, have um, you would a lot of on part of your frame. So then you would put the magazine or the film film holder back in here, close it, and then you would wind this crank up to the first frame. Then you would put the back <clears throat> on the camera body now you can't shoot it yet you can't take any photos yet until you remove the dark slide so they would have to do that you pull out the dark slide and this camera has been sitting quietly for years so <laughs> i'm having some problems getting the dark slide out here but then you could make an exposure turn the crank 
make another exposure. This magazine is uh, a A24 magazine, which would hold 220 film. Uh, and, would, and with this camera, you would get 24 exposures. Uh, a, a 12 back would use 120 film and you would get 12 exposures. Now, Wally on his first flight, now we have some photos here of, uh, of the camera, had these small magazines on them. However, what the cameras transformed into the electric version of the Hasselblad, which... There's Deke has. Slayton. I put a picture up of Deke Slayton and Sharon. That's C.C. Williams on the right that lost his life in a car in a uh, plane crash. Um, yeah. So once we got to the moon and then in Skylab and then in the early shuttle, pre-digital, we had the electric Hasselblad, the winder. So we would take, trying to get that dark slide out so we could get shot. <laughs> it pulled all, it pulled all the foam out. See that? One of the, yeah. one of the reasons that the hustle, now we'd like to tell people the camera itself, uh, you know, is contained in the film and now it contains the digital chip to replace the film. But the true value of a camera is in its lens. The quality of a camera is dictated by the quality of that lens, the image is taken. And Hasselblad uh, was not only renowned for the precision German engineering of the camera, but the Zeiss lenses were Correct. also superior to anything at the time and still today. Right. And the electric version, the EL version of the camera, is what they used on the surface of the moon. So they would have the lens would be on here, whichever one they were using, and back here, they would have a little bit of a strong, a longer back. There you go. So instead of, of the back being like this, it would extend out like this, and it would hold a 50 foot roll of 70 millimeter. Was it, was it 50 or 15? Uh, it was 250 exposures. Right, so a 250 exposure back on that camera would allow more time for more image to shoot. So because they couldn't change film up there. They, they never unloaded and loaded a camera on the moon. They took up magazines, uh, except they were the 70 millimeter magazines, which were a little longer. And uh, they used those up there. And then uh, after all the EVAs and uh, they were getting ready to come home, they took the magazines off the back of the camera there and the cameras lost out along with the backpacks tossed them and, out the door and, and anything else because that's weight those beautiful and, lenses uh, the back the, the lenses the cameras. yeah the only part that came back was the magazine and they each magazine had numbers on it mm -hmm. so of all that that's what came back now you can go to Flickr, do the apollo archive gallery on Flickr. every image that they took with uh in the space program apollo particularly is in order they just scanned the actual negatives right so you can see the sprocket holes of the negatives you see the numbers of the negatives you see all the bad shots they took and uh he's got tom's going to talk a little bit more about that here but here's one of the first pictures ever taken with a house blood out right of, uh, that was that, yes, that was taken during uh, wally shiraz sigma 7 flight in I believe October of 1962, there you go. and basically it was just an Earth-looking shot, which is, but yeah. it, it got it let them see how much uh, resolution and how much better that kind of camera was than uh, than a 35 millimeter camera, and so that this helped them decide what to take to the moon, and uh, there's the different pieces and parts. Right, and we can see <laughs> this apparently looks like. The things that Wally took up with him on that flight looks like the food and things up top. But as you can see, the camera there at the bottom without the back on. Great. And there is the, one of the magazines over there that you can see uh, with the dark slide partially out. And if you notice at the top now on this, on my camera here, there is a viewfinder, which you could look in and focus. And this, uh, mm -hmm. but here, one. Yeah, show that. I'll show that. Okay. But if you look at number one over there on the graphic, 
you'll see that there is no finder on there. They have just put some kind of uh, okay. some kind of uh, plate over there. So You'd be looking. he wasn't focusing. He basically had the camera lens, I would imagine, at infinity and pointed it out the window and took the pictures. Uh, he had the crank there. He had to do that because it wasn't an electronic uh, drive, but uh, that was it. So as you see, the cameras are, are very, very similar. And here's today's modern 35 millimeter off the shelf Rebel Canon camera there. Many of you own uh, on there. So uh, the, uh, and like I said, I encourage you to go to Flickr and see these photographs. And that's why they call it magazine. You'll see film magazine uh, on there. Uh, so tell us, uh, uh, so many of the shots inside the command modules and lunar modules are out of focus, and, and you have a, you know a reason why. Well, they they did have 35, on later flights, they did have 35 millimeter cameras up there too for just what you said, the command module was a very limited, had limited space in, and these cameras, the Hasselblads, did not have a real short focusing um, ability. So if you, if you look at this picture, they were trying to focus. That's, uh, that's Rusty Schweiker on Apollo 9. They had probably were trying to focus on him, but the closest they could get was behind him there uh, inside the uh, command module. And that came out to, to be sharp, uh, sharper than his face there in the foreground. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, reason, uh, the reason why. Now, later on, Jim McDivitt, the commander of the flight, had a Hasselblad in the LEM with him and took this photograph um, of Rusty when he did uh, when he did the first EVA in, a, in Apollo with the... Uh, Stand-up EVA on the porch. On the porch with the uh, testing the backpack and the suit. Sweet. We're talking with Tom <laughs> Usiak and his brother Mark's beside him. Two uh, excellent photographers, uh, been involved in photography all their lives, from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mark's down here to document the uh, Artemis launch, and uh, Tom's here just to aggravate Carlton, I think. <laughs> and they brought me shoe fly pie, and I'm enjoying it over here. I was the delivery man. He's the photographer. <laughs> Carlton's our gracious host. Yeah, there you go. But uh, So we're having a good time talking about a little bit of the cameras, things that you don't think about when these iconic images are taken like this one. Now this is a this is an image of the lunar module in Earth orbit and this was taken from the command module by command module pilot Dave Scott and he also had a uh, had a Hasselblad camera and uh, LM3 Marty Riegel worked right. on that uh, lunar module tail number 3 right uh, and it's the only one that you will see that pole Marty's going to circle that pole for me there on the ladder the all the landers do not have that uh uh, uh, uh probe it's probe yeah yeah the uh, uh surface probe that's five feet long when that touched the surface a blue light came on on the console there and uh they had touched the surface of another world and they were supposed to shut the engine off and drop down because there's shock absorbers in there but uh marty why'd they take that Probe off. In case of bends pointing up towards the ladder and the astronaut backing down. They're worried about it bending up towards the ladder and the astronauts would be in the way and and uh, block them walking down the ladder there. So uh, damage the suit. Damage the suit. Go out, oh, cheeks. What's that poking me <laughs> in there? But well, now we're doing some training with these Hasselblad cameras there. Right. What we have here is. Um, is Jim Irwin and Dave Scott training during Apollo 15. Hasselblad's behind Mark's head there. There you go. Yeah. And you can see it, it's basically this camera. And that is a wide angle lens. Again, they did not fo look down and focus a camera on the moon. They used a wider angle lens on the surface of the moon because it had more you know, focus. In other words, it was preset. It was pre preset focus. And they had a little bit more uh, more uh, latitude with that. And if you can look here at the bottom, the way they tricked the, tripped the camera, here is the standard release button 
on the Hasselblad EL model camera, mm -hmm. but they didn't do that. They had, if we go back to that photo, and uh, yeah, 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 well, they had a little handle at the bottom, and uh, they, oh, would, did they? It would they would squeeze that right there, and what that would do is it it would push in the button, so. So that it would um, be a lot okay. easier for them to, to take the picture, uh, make the photograph. So they had a grip, like a vertical right, grip. Right, right. Yeah, it was a vertical grip, and they'd, they'd squeeze it like that. Because they couldn't see in those helmets. They couldn't get down and look through. They had no viewfinder to look through either. They it, were just pointing, basically. And right, and they were getting... having the wide angle gave them more latitude to, to hit their target. But you look at all the classic moon photos, you know, the, the one of Buzz Aldrin, which is probably the most iconic. And then you have the Paul 16, John Young jump salute, the famous one where he's jumping up and saluting. Well, when Charlie Duke took those pictures, he had the camera like this on his chest, like Dave uh, or Jim Irwin has there. And he pointed it and told John to, to give him a salute, a big Navy salute. Yeah. And, and then when John jumped, he made the exposure so he got everything got everything in the in the picture and it also uh, was a good thing they they shot a lot of panoramics of the surface up they there did. which which with today's technology seemed together just perfectly and uh again with the wide angle they would just overlap like that and make it uh, make it happen uh, of all the things they had to learn about going to the moon and back, uh, I understand that the photography, you know, they might not have spent as much time on as, uh, you know, take the tourist pictures. And if you and I would have gone to the moon or any three of us, we uh, uh, this one would have been laying on his belly taking a low angle shot of the rocks. And I probably would have been trying to climb back up on the ladder and getting some uh, air, higher views of it. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Did you hear anything about that in their training or so forth? Was it just a uh, uh, good luck? A lot of, you, you see these pictures on Flickr, a lot of them are overexposed. A well, lot. well I, there's one story that I remember from Space Fest and we were talking with Gene Cernan and if you go into your Apollo 17 galleries and things like that, you'll see two photos in there. One that Schmidt took of, of Gene uh, with the flag where Gene's reaching out the flag and the earth is in the background. And, uh, and then th he handed uh, the camera off to Gene and Gene took that photo of him too, of Jack with the flag and, and everything like that. What Gene told us, he said, and that was with wide angle lens, and Gene said he took the camera like this off of the, you know, mount on the, on the, on the suit and held it down between his legs and pointed it up at, at Jack Schmidt like that. And that's how that, that picture was taken. Wow. If you look in that, if you look at that picture and you look closely in the, um, in the visor, the reflection, I believe you can see that Gene is down there with the camera taking the picture, just like. The famous Apollo 11 shot where uh, Neil is reflected in uh, in Buzz's visor. Very interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, these iconic photographs. It's uh, uh, like I, I'm trying to express. It was not on their high priority list to be good photographers. All right, they just wanted to make sure that they could capture the images, much like a tourist and. And, uh, uh, and 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 when we go back this next time, it'll probably be more a little more artistic than 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 the, the apollo guys did but they did a great job oh, absolutely no absolutely it. they took a lot of great uh again again this is all available on these many galleries that are out there um uh hasselblad photographs of rock formations and things like that um yeah there's a hasselblad on the chest of that astronaut that would be uh, Jim Irwin. Okay. Took that photograph of Dave Scott driving the rover. So all he really had to do was just point it, and uh, he uh, had him centered perfectly there. Mm -hmm. Three rovers driven on the moon, six guys sat in it. The commander always drove it, he never let the pilot drive it. I don't know. The, every picture I've ever seen, the commander was driving it. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was, uh, you would think that, uh, you know, they would have said, hey, take a 
for a little spin there while I'm busting this rock over here, you know. Uh, but no, and that's sort of protocol and NASA and everything, not wanting to get too many uh, uh, cooks in the stew, probably, you know, uh, on there. So, uh, but uh, what, a, what, a, what a beautiful way to talk about, uh, to, to remember going back to the moon with Artemis by talking about 50 years ago, the technology that has given us these beautiful pictures like that. And there's a perfect uh, example right there of the advantage of the larger film. Uh, the Hasselblad lens and overall quality, the resolution in that photograph. Yeah. I saw that photograph reproduced at Space Fest a few years ago. And I think it was like 40 by 40, uh, 30 by 30, a giant, well, it's bigger than 30 by 30, but, uh, and I'm looking at that thing and, and it was, it would, it was scanned. So the, the original film, it was from the original film that was scanned, but, that thing was so sharp. I mean, I'm looking at that and saying, wow. Tom, why is it, why is why is why is so many black and white pictures? Why don't they just take all color pictures? Well, I never really asked that question, but I'll give you my opinion. Black and white film is basically archival forever, if you store it properly. Color film over a period of time changes. And that was evident in some of the photographs that were shot in color that we saw uh, we saw them online and they were called like AS16 so-and-so unprocessed. Mm -hmm. And you'd look at it and the contrast was down a little bit. The colors had, it had a, the color of, of the <laughs> transparency was, was kind of funny because all the, all the color film that was shot during the space program up until some period of time in the shuttle and then they used both was transparency film kodak and they made it kodak made them a very special type of film positives for you people there was there. slides slide, slide yeah. film that was extra thin the film was was thinner than the stuff you would buy at the at the camera shop or from the pro uh pro dealers and stuff like that so um but it was still transparency and over time that color dyes change no matter how well you, you store them and and it not much but you take those old uh, films and you scan them and then you take them into uh, an editing program and you can make those things look like they were taken uh, last week instead of 50 years ago and, uh, that's frankly that's, that's, how we, that's how we did a lot of the, a lot of the photos that you uh, show of ours or kind enough to show of ours on stay curious uh, are from color negatives and they seem to be even a little bit more vulnerable than transparency film to to changing and um, so i would scan them on a very when i had the lab i had a very very good scanner mm -hmm. and i scanned all that film and then i gave it turned it over here to my brother who who works in the digital imaging field and he just went in there and and restored we didn't change anything we didn't change the subject but all we did was bring the film bring the image back to as close as we could get it to when it was taken mm -hmm. well we love showing your your photography for sure and uh because uh, they're such good photographers uh uh but uh have you lost my p.o box number i haven't seen a check for a while <laughs> <laughs> it's in the mail Oh, yeah, remember I, I sent you a check that time. It only took two months to get it. Yeah, yeah, you did. You absolutely <laughs> did. So you did. In fact, I had to stop payment on it and write you another one. <laughs> yeah, that was for your uh, membership yeah. at the ASM here. Yeah. We appreciate that. No, we're. Uh, that's what we want to do on Stay Curious is seek out the professionals uh, that that have the stories to tell that that lived uh, the the Space Coast. Uh, we're just, Marty and I are just facilitators of, of all the good work that people like yourself and, and Carlton Bailey, uh, you, you know, we had Carlton's birthday Tuesday. I saw it. On hair. But, and, uh, yeah. you should have had that chocolate cake, four layered chocolate cake. Now you're delicious. talking. Chocolate cake is my favorite. Yeah. Well, the shoe uh, pie ply is not kind of, that's not too bad. It's either I haven't had lunch today, which I haven't. <laughs> Or I do have a sweet tooth, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna get me a whole bunch of Cool Whip, and we'll make and an Amish man out of you. Maybe you'll make an Amish man out of me. Yeah, that's for doggone sure. Well, we got one more photo uh, picture to show here, and this is uh, Skylab. It's actually Owen Garriott on Skylab Two, the set or Skylab Three, if you're in the journal. The journalists call it three. The engineers call it two. 
And uh, what is that on the on that box? I, I, I wanted you guys, I put this in here because we heard a story about that last night from Jack Lausema. So what's in that box on that boom there? That's film from the Apollo telescope mount. They had to risk their lives to get the data out of the telescope that was the key part of uh, the, the Apollo uh, Skylab. And film like this, although it's bigger film in there, uh, yeah, I always find that amazing that, that they had to risk their lives on a spacewalk to change out the film and bring back the data. Well, they did basically what Al Warden and Ken Mattingly and Ron Evans did on their flights back from the moon when they did an EVA, went back into the service module to take out what was it called, the Simbe, Simbe film uh -huh. uh, for the, the lunar mapping camera and uh, did the same thing, brought it there because today when they take pictures, they uh, download them to Earth. Um, you, you can take a picture on the space station now and then an hour, it could be uh, on the air. Yeah. Or in your hands. I'd stay curious if we got a print here. Yeah, it is quite amazing. Of course, uh, it ended a career for both you and me, owning <laughs> your film lab and me running a, 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 a rich camera, because where's the camera stores today? Well, they're crickets, crickets, crickets. Yeah. They're, uh, there's a, they're few and far between. They're diminishing. Yeah. They're still there. There's the good ones, but bigger cities out there. But and, they're, uh, they're uh, the local uh, local ones are are yeah, gone. Yeah, sure, going there. Well, let's get the Mark Usiak uh, involved here a little bit by showing this beautiful picture of. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. That's my picture. But I'll let you just. I'll let you decide if it's beautiful or not. But uh, this was out at the uh, wildlife uh, refuge, Maritime uh, Wildlife Refuge, at one of the. Uh, so, uh, Mark, you got credentialed out there. Uh, this is what we're going to be looking at uh, uh, Monday uh, on Max Brewer Bridge. And afterwards, it's going to look like this. Okay. Uh, uh, so don't you're not going to get home too fast and so forth. So what's it like to, to be out there and let's say everything goes as planned, all right, and, and then yeah. uh, how in the heck you get off the... the Merritt Island. Fortunately, Fort. I'm not going to have to be in that crowd. Uh, I will be in the press site, uh, which is about three and a half miles, uh, about three and a half miles away. This is uh, Max Brewer, I think is uh, 10. Is that 10 miles from the pad? Yes. Max Brewer. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, it is River a great Ridge. view. This is right. Space View Park, our, our Rocket Hobo, Ozzy. Mario will be selling t-shirts. I'll be wandering around there with Tom. I'm just going to kind of play it by ear, Tom, because I think the, the shots that you and I are looking for are more the people's reactions in the crowd and and, and that sort of thing. You uh, uh, you have to uh, give it to your brother out there to get the professional shot. Well, I'll tell you, if, if this thing goes on time on Monday morning, um, I'll do my best to get you a shot that you can put up on, on Stay Curious at 4 o'clock on Monday. No, with, well, thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, um, uh, that'll be, it'll be shot from the press site. Um, like yeah. I said, tomorrow I'm putting out three remote camera, sound activated remote cameras uh, that'll be anywhere from half mile to two miles mm -hmm. away from the, from the launch pad. But I will be at the press site, which is, I guess, a little squit less than four miles from the pad. And I'll have those right away. Because I'll just, you know, here's, this is, in fact, this is the camera that I will be using for the launch. And the frame rate will be like that. Yeah, we know his frame so, rate. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm the spray and pray guy. But, he, he um, spray and pray. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that'll be, I mean, there's, there'll, there'll be quite a, a couple hundred people in, in the area where I will be. And then, uh. I'll be able to download the images right there on the spot, uh, upload them uh, onto my phone, uh, send them to the people that I am uh, photographing this for, and then uh, remote camera pickup for the, the cards won't be till the following day. So you won't see any of the super close-up shots mm -hmm. until Tuesday or Wednesday. But you I'll hear that, Mike Killian? Yeah, <laughs> he's out there now. You, you can <laughs> email your pictures before him. We'll put yours on. There you go. And that, that's uh, move your head there a minute, Tom, so they can see Artemis 
right there. The white is Artemis. Cover it with my thumb. But that's about how you see it from Space View Park or anywhere around here. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, bigger in your mind's eye type of thing when you're looking at it. But, uh, yeah, we're, look, we're, we're looking forward to that. We're, we're looking forward to sharing your pictures of it. And, and uh, let's all keep our fingers crossed and hope it goes on time. It's got a two-hour window. Uh, weather really isn't a, uh, an issue in the morning around here. It's in the evening where we're having these thunderstorms from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock every night. Seems like, boy, that thing has been hammered out there by a lot of storms. So, Marty, you got some questions there I've been putting off. Yeah, they saying he's asking, didn't one of the Apollo missions least see some film magazines on the surface of the state? state? Uh, yes, I believe um, 12. Apollo 12 did. And there was also a magazine that was not accounted for in, uh, on Apollo 14. Mm -hmm. Now, those, those are the only two that I know of. I would say they're fried in their magazines by <laughs> solar radiation by now. But, yeah, uh, as successful in pinpoint landing as Apollo 12 was, one, the color TV camera got accidentally exposed to the sun and burned out the video con too. And two, they left a couple of magazines of color on the, on, on the moon. But like I said, they were more worried about getting their butts off the moon alive than they were their tourist pictures. Yes, Marty. Owen Blevins is asking uh, Tom and Mark, how many launches have each of you witnessed live? Who, who asked that question? Uh, it's a friend, he's a friend from uh, Lancaster. Hey, Owen. Uh, Hi, Owen Blevins. He's down here visiting his brother, Clayton, who has a place down uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, he's not south south of here. Um, known Owen since we were kids there on College Avenue. All uh, right. So anyway, um, how many... God. I mean, we go back. I mean, Tom... Tom and I both saw Apollo 15. Uh, he was accredited. I was not. And that was back in 1971. So between 1971 and 2022, probably what's the math? Yeah, probably. 75, well, 75. Yeah, 75. Would be a good, would be a so. good accurate. Guess. Yeah. I mean, between manned and unmanned. Um, never made it to Vandenberg. Our friend Carlton here is a, is a Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base. Uh, California Better launch pad better. guy, um, but we've I've I've been to Wallops, uh, Wallops Island in Virginia, and here at the Cape, well, 70, 70 plus times. Let's put it uh, in the last fifty years, and then I mean we've seen landings, uh, photographed the landings coming back. Uh, we were just talking about Jack Lausma. Um, he was the only commander. It was him and Gordon Fullerton that landed the third. Uh, space shuttle flight in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. And that was out of 135 flights, that was the only one that landed mm -hmm. in New Mexico. And uh, Steve Nolde and I were fortunate enough to, to be there to see that. So a lot. Let's just put it a lot. We, we paid our, we've got the mosquito bites and uh, sunburned to, uh, to pay the dues, but love it. Love it. Like, I'm so excited for Monday. Good, good. Any other questions, Marty? Yep. Thank you, everybody, watching today. We got uh, Ashley Kendrick. Thank you for watching. You take care of our grandbaby this weekend. Uh, uh, and uh, Tom's got some young kids, too, that uh, he's a grandpa, and he's, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a fun thing to do. You do. And, I have two grandchildren. And uh, uh, this one's only about 10 months old, and she's just starting to walk, so... Uh, you put a leash on her, but don't put a leash on her there, uh, uh, Ashley. Uh, but she'll be, you'll be chasing her, I know for sure there. Uh, Dave Stangy's watching. We got, of course, our Dundee Scotland friend, Robert Laws, enjoying a cocktail, cocktail on a Friday night up there. Hope you're uh, doing Robert. good, Robert. Hey. You guys ever meet Robert? No. 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 All right. Well, he'll be down here one day. There's your friend Owen Blevins. Who else yep. we have there? Marsha Folly. Marsha Follick, hi to you. Hello. I, and, I haven't and, had uh, the pleasure uh, of meeting her. Neil 1030's out there. Okay, he must be a cyborg, Neil 1030. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Stay curious on there. So, uh, guys, I just wanted to put one nostalgic photo up there. It's just so uh, people really don't forget 
that uh, the most powerful rocket in the world right now is a Saturn V rocket. Raw fuel of liquid hydrogen fuel uh, on there. Uh, it's a little, to me, it's not comparing apples and oranges when you compare the two. I mean, it's comparing apples and oranges. It's not apples and apples and oranges and oranges because of solid rocket boosters. Uh, but still, this is what Artemis, It's uh, it rests on the shoulders of these two giant spacecraft there at the VAB. And you photographed the Saturn, yeah. mighty Saturn V. Probably my, uh, you know, best memory now that I'm pretty much, or I'm retired, uh, in my photographic career was being able to see multiple launches of the Saturn V. Um, it was just two things I always remember the Saturn V is just before it lift off that huge, I think I've even said that before on here, that huge wall of flame uh, coming out of the flame trench and it's just sitting there. And then when it starts up, it, cre it creeps up the tower and then starts to tilt a little to avoid uh, coming in contact with the mobile launcher and then on its way. Wonderful memory. Mark, is it going to look like that or how, what's it going to look like? Well, uh, the Artemis uh, launch. these guys, I was talking to some other photographers out at the launch at the uh, press site today, and they said it's going to take about six seconds to clear the tower, this thing. So mm -hmm. um, it's heavier than the shuttle. Uh, it's got more engines. It's got more thrust. But uh, we'll see. I mean, it's they they never had a. This is obviously the first time they've ever flown, and they've never had an on pad test firing like they did with the shuttle. Mm -hmm. And for my panicking Steve Nolte uh, sound trigger guy, um, we don't have a we don't have a launch decibel. I mean, we know what the things are going to set. They're going to set, and it's. Well, there was a, there was a flight readiness firing that they used to do for the shuttles, and that's kind of like when we calibrated our sound triggers. We knew then how loud it was going to be, uh -huh. and um, so that helped us. Marty's correcting you there. You better be. Know that's what you're all right. Talking yep, about, yep, you, yep, 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 yep. you can go back and look. There was flight called flight readiness firing. Uh -huh. you know? Each uh, orbiter before before each orbiter flew for the first time, they turned the engines on. What was it? Six seconds. No, 20 or seconds, 20, 19, 19, 20 seconds, 19 20 or 20 seconds. 20 seconds that would just sit there on the pad and burn before they get the solids up. Discovery effort for the reflight and Endeavor before its first flight, and they put us out on that mound by Deep okay. Road, where, yep. which is not where, too far away. Yeah, hmm. so that was that was good for photographers to get the equipment that they were going to place out there for the remotes. This thing's a new ball of wax, and like I, I was telling these guys in the press New site ball today. Of wax. I hadn't heard that expression. Yeah, in a while. well, I, I, you I don't Pennsylvania know. You Pennsylvania guys are <laughs> bringing down here the... I'm not a gloom and tax. doomer by any means, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm I'm apprehensive. Let's put it that way. Maybe it's just the, the Pennsylvania Dutch in me. I don't know, but it, it, I'm just apprehensive of whether or not my sound trigger is going to be able to compensate for having the engines underneath a, a metallic structure with water being poured on it before it takes off. Oh, so, those, are, those are really interesting things to think through. And that's why you're a professional photographer and and out there doing it. So uh, good luck to you, Mark. Thank hope, you. hope things work good for Me you too. there. Me too. Uh, great to have you here, my friend. Likewise, sir. Tom, thank you, buddy. My shoe fly pie, <laughs> loving it, <laughs> eating it here. I'm going to enjoy it the, the rest of the day here. Marty. Thank you for coming here at the end of our Streamlabs program. We've got uh, 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 I got Dave Stengy saying hopefully the next time that we see you, we'll be seeing a, a rocket on the moon or going to the moon. Uh, the Orion spacecraft is going to orbit the moon in a big looping orbit. And then we still need to have Elon Musk uh, finish up his uh, starship because that's where we're going to land on the moon. Fingers crossed. So. Wait till that baby takes off from pad 39A. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be a, that's going to be a, a I think attention be, that, getter. To me, that's a bigger <laughs> event than this is in many well, ways. Absolutely. We're, yeah. We're, and and yeah. Uh, they're the big starship. They're building a mammoth gantry beside the, the tiny little SpaceX Falcon 9 gantry they have for their 
Starlink satellites on pad uh, 39A. And this is on 39B. So we know some of you all are coming down for it. We want to remind you that the American Space Museum will be open Saturday, 10 to 5, maybe a little later if we got a, little pe- a lot of people in here. We're going to open up Sunday from noon to 6 for everybody to come in and clean our, our, our merchandise out for us, okay? So we can put new stuff in. We do have Artemis shirts. Should have had one here on the set here, but uh, wasn't thinking about that without my good co-producer Marty wasn't here to kick it off. But Marty, I think we got it off uh as good as we could do thank you everybody for watching today all right and uh uh, guys we uh good luck to y'all here everybody be safe and we will see you next week to to bridge bridge the space space between between us. us